Let's do now. So this is this is probably the hardest time to speak. It's right after lunch. We're all fed. We're happy. The coffee hasn't sunk in yet. But just a really quick, uh, I don't care if it's a show of hands, if it's a, if it's applause, if it's a cheer, who is getting a lot out of today? Who's going to be here? And I had a great lunch with some of the speakers here and Dr. Sanger, and we were talking about some of the challenges that the community faces, and we have a lot of resources and a lot of push and a lot of great initiatives. What the area does a very poor job of is broadcasting the resources that we have here. So when there's startups or companies in the area that look for resources, they have a hard time finding the talent that's right in their backyard. And when there's large employers or other employers looking to come into our area, they have a hard time finding out what's available in the area that can support their, their efforts. So uh, somebody that's absolutely championed that, who is bringing this this process through with, with an absolute wave and is making a huge difference in our community through Binghamton University. And someone's been a huge sponsor, supporter, contributor, and attendee of these meetups and our keynote speaker today. And I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Harvey Stanger. <laughs> Speaker, uh, although the worst was Friday night when I was an after dinner speaker with a bunch of faculty who just came out of a, a reception. Um, but I kept them, I kept them going for a few minutes. Uh, I know my time is, is brief, about 20 minutes, and, and the next presentations after me are actually some of Bank University students who are going to talk about their companies. So if, I, if I'm stealing time, I'm stealing away from them. I feel a little guilty about that, but I, but I will, do really want to talk about probably the most important issue that we are all faced with, and one that I am personally attached to now, uh, a little bit by choice as well. A little bit about my background. I grew up in a small town near Syracuse, New York. I lived as a student in Ithaca, New York. I worked as an administrator at, in Buffalo, and now I live in Binghamton. So I have seen uh, four of those urban areas in New York State firsthand over a period of about 35 years. And while I'm not a historian or an economist, I can definitely see that things have changed significantly, whether it's for my sister or brother-in-law's very small business, or the state of population or employment in upstate New York. I also was along the way, I lived in Boston, Massachusetts for five years, and I lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for 23 years. Uh, Boston certainly went through a, a downturn in the, in the real estate market, but is certainly thriving. And Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, I watched a steel company go out of business overnight and saw a town that rallied around that failure to recover and has done quite well. So now I have uh, Bampton as my current project. Um, first, as I said, I'm not a, an economist, I'm not a historian, but I do recognize when you look at an economy, and you look at an economy like the southern tier, or let's make it even smaller, the the metropolitan area called Greater Binghamton, which is Broome and Tyler County. A strong economy requires that the dollars that are spent within that economy come from outside the economy. It's a fairly simple economic uh, truism that if you draw a circle around, if you painted dollars, and those dollars came from Long Island, or New York City, or Pennsylvania, or New Jersey, those dollars came here and were spent here those dollars are much more valuable than me handing a dollar to somebody who lives here for our regional economy. So as we think about dollars coming from outside the economy, we have to understand what roles we play. 
and what we're trying to, to uh, impact here. Eventually, I will get to the Upstate Revitalization Program. But first, I want to talk about the Upstate Revitalization Program in small letters. The, the Binghamton area, since 19, from 19, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, 1990 to 2010, those 20 years, lost on average pretty consistently 1,000 good producing jobs, goods producing jobs. Sometimes people call those manufacturing jobs. But the other term is goods, which includes construction, mining, um, uh, and mineral extraction, although most of it was manufacturing here. So we went from approximately, my glasses on, from approximately 39,000 jobs in goods producing to 18,000 jobs over that 20 year period. 1,000 jobs lost every year. Now at the same time, our service producing, our service providing jobs increased. Uh, went from 60,000 to 66,000. And, and when you look about the, the national balance, we actually were higher on a percentage, wall, percentage basis than the national average in terms of goods producing jobs than service providing jobs. And that was one of our strengths, certainly IBM, EJ, etc. Those were our strengths during World War II and, and shortly after World War II, but that became our vulnerability as well. And so to lose a thousand jobs each year, in, and again, remember, manufacturing companies per employee have revenues on the order of five hundred thousand dollars a year to a million dollars a year. So if you look at the sales per employee of a manufacturing company, it's about five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars a year. A million dollars a year being being a uh, very high value added, uh, low cost industry like the petroleum industry. Service providing jobs do not have that kind of revenue generation per employee. And so you're going to, and you know, people always say service jobs are, aren't as good as goods producing jobs. And well, they're, they're great jobs. I mean, to run a service industry is certainly important, but they don't attract those dollars from outside the region as well, A, because the jobs are lower paying, but B, also because the services are typically provided internally to the region. Whereas a manufactured good is sold outside the region. So a Raymond Corporation. They don't sell all those forklifts in Broome and Tyler County, do they, Jim? No. No, I think probably sell very few here. But they're employing hundreds and hundreds of people there manufacturing something that then ends up outside of a region and the dollars flow in. And so as we start to think about how we can address the change in the economy, we have to think about that's kind of our model right now. And when I think of outside dollars, me as, a, as an importer of outside dollars, I look at Long Island, I look at Manhattan, because that's where my students come from. I also look at India and China and Korea, because where, where many of my students come from as well. About a thousand jobs a year is, is impossible for one organization to overcome. Um, I can add, Binghamton University can add, has added in the last three years about 70 jobs or seven zero jobs per year. Good paying jobs, um, strong jobs for the intellectual capital of the region, but it is nowhere near the need that we have. And so where do the other 930 jobs come from each year that we need high, good paying, strong jobs come from in this area? And I'm looking at it right now. I think I'm looking at the audience and if we go around the room and everybody says, okay, I'll get five, I'll get 10, I'll get 15, I'll get 20, and we keep that number between 5 and 20, we get there. But then you got to do it again next year, too. So the growth rate that we have to overcome seems uh, significantly difficult. Painting a dark picture? No. Uh, I, I don't think so at all. I think I'm kind of painting a picture of evolution, of a trend, of a mega trend across the entire country, as other people have, have observed as well. So then the governor, Governor Cuomo, comes along. And he says, well, I'll probably said it not in public, holy cow, have I got a problem. And I believe that the things that he's tried so far haven't been given enough time, haven't been given enough uh, energy behind them uh, to change. But I will give him credit for at least proposing ideas, following through on those ideas for five years. And I do think that they have a potential. The first thing that he did, 
And he's given this speech many times, and much better than I can do it. First thing he did is he says, I'm going to let the regions own the problem and the solutions, and that he will be the supplier of the resources for those solutions and those problems. The way he did it, I think, was really make it a competition. Make these 10 regions across the state compete for resources, not in project by project ways, but, but, but behind a strategic plan that the university, or sorry, that the region would have to put together. And so the first year that we put ours together, the strategic plan for the southern tier, I think, was an excellent plan. I was still in Buffalo then, uh, wondering what this competition was all about. When I got here, I was, was fully immersed in it. And the competition that year gave the Southern Tier uh, second place. And there was really only first place and second place in that year of competition. But we had just gone through the flood of 2011, and that certainly was a reason for us maybe not providing the best of plan as we possibly could. Years two, three, and four, we became top performers. And it was not because we had great projects, because we had a great team putting together a great plan each year. And that plan had priorities. The plan included all of our strengths and all, also the things that we knew that we could do better. That wasn't enough, though. He said, okay, I've got these regions competing against each other. I like competition. I've got some money, about $750 million of capital that he's going to invest into those regions. And if you win, you get about $100 million, And if you lose, you get about $50 million. And by winning three years in a row, we were, we were pretty successful. And he said, this is going to take forever. This is a very slow process. It takes a whole year to gather these plans. I need something that is going to work all the time, day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And he created Startup New York. And again, I've heard a lot of complaints, a lot of criticism of Startup New York. Startup New York is about giving somebody something that all of us who've been here our whole lives have, don't have access to. And that's tax-free. Um, and certainly that's a pretty good argument for those who have been here a long time and rode through the difficult economic times. That why aren't they eligible for the tax-free benefits of starting New York? And that's a good argument, but I think the governor's idea of, well, I'm bringing people here, and now his boundary is the boundary of New York State, not the boundary of the southern tier, I'm bringing people into New York State who have never even lived here before. Because one of our serious problems in upstate New York is our drop in population. And so by creating startup zones around SUNY campuses and some private college campuses, tax-free zones, startup zones to allow new companies to enter into, come into New York, New York State, or perhaps a company that's already in New York State that is adding a new division, or a brand new idea that just bubbles out of one of our laboratories on campus are jobs that would not have existed. And so that they are net new jobs. And when you look at the total income tax or property tax, or sales tax, or corporation tax that is paid by the state into the state budget, it will increase. But perhaps there's a bit of an advantage to those who are willing to come to New York State and try us on. And I think that's a fairly reasonable entree to allow people to come in and try us on for a while and see if this is where they want to run their business for many, many decades, even though New York State startup is only going to be there for, for 10 years. That wasn't enough because he saw that that was going to be too small, too, and too slow. Startup New York, he's talking about, we have five companies, I'll talk a little bit about them, at James University, Buffalo has 19, we're number one and two in the whole Startup New York system right now. 24 companies, probably total employees less than 200 or 300 across the entire state in start New York right now. But it is a good idea, but it's just one piece. And then he came along and said, again, the governor's not a very patient guy, as I've learned. He likes to see action, he likes to see change and improvements. He created the Upstate Revitalization Program. Again, very controversial. Uh, this one is controversial not because uh, we're giving something to people who aren't actually living here yet, this is an investment in the current population of New York, but it is again a competition. And it's a competition against seven eligible regions. He's eliminated Western New York, Long Island, and New York City, seven eligible regions that will have an opportunity to win $500 million. And not just in capital this time, $500 million of funds that could be flexibly used to pay salaries, to create infrastructure, 
and to invest capital in public as well as private projects. The, the competition is kind of exciting. I, I love competition, love the aspect of a game. I think when there's a game, you bring your best to it. Uh, if the competition has a lot at stake, you work even a little bit harder at the game that you're bringing to it. So let's look at the competition. We've got the Finger Lakes region, Rochester, pretty big city. We've got the Central New York region, Syracuse, again, pretty big city. The Capital District, two pretty big cities. Troy is actually a bigger city than Binghamton in population and Albany. So you've got the Capital District. And then you have the North Country, which is centered around Watertown, Potsdam. You've got the Mohawk Valley, which is centered around Utica and Rome. And you have the Hudson Valley, lower mid-Hudson Valley, which is uh, probably Kingston, Westchester, and the Southern Tier. Uh, so what is, what's our game plan right now? I'm working on this with the Regional Economic Development Council. My co-chair, Tom Tranner, is in Corning. Uh, we have a lot of input from our folks at Ithaca, at Cornell University, with Mary Opperman. And we are now in the process of uh, building what we think will be a competitive, perhaps a, an award-winning proposal. The concept is not that we're going to submit a series of projects that add up to $500 million, which is what the three winners will receive. The idea is when you put together initiatives, three or four key initiatives that you believe your region is good at and can get even better at, that will start to turn that employment base, the population base, and the unemployment statistics that we have. We don't know what they are. Uh, we're still developing them. But I can tell you what Buffalo did. And Buffalo is the model. Not only is Buffalo the model, but the new president of the Empire State Development Corporation which actually will be monitoring the competition, is the past regional co-chair of the Buffalo Western New York REDC, um, Howard Zinson. So Howard is one of the people who are going to decide it. The governor also hired Richard Toby, who was the uh, deputy executive, the deputy county executive in Erie County, as a person who's managing this process. So I think the model of Buffalo is a good thing to look at. Buffalo had three things. Advanced manufacturing, tourism, and academic partnerships. And I think that if we can kind of think about that for our region, how can we uh, duplicate that? Advanced manufacturing, they brought in a huge company, multi-million square foot facility called Solar City, where they'll be building solar panels. I think it'll be the largest solar panel manufacturing facility in the United States. Tourism, Niagara Falls. When you go to Niagara Falls, everybody wants to go to the Canadian side. More things to do, a better view. Why not change that? And the problem is that there's a highway that runs between Niagara Falls City in the US side and the falls. So let's move the uh, highway, get people closer to the waterfront. And academic partnerships, Buffalo, University of Buffalo, moved their medical campus downtown uh, into a fairly impoverished neighborhood in the city of Buffalo to help regenerate, rejuvenate that area. I think we can model our proposals and our initiatives after that. Certainly, we are a strong manufacturing area. There's, I think there's approximately 3 million square feet of manufacturing space vacant in Indica. Uh, I believe that we have some tourism aspects that will sell very well. Uh, whether you think of the Corning Museum of Glass at the high end, or the winery tours, or just the state parks that we have across the southern tier. It's how we package it and put it together. In academic partnerships, we have Binghamton University, kind of an up and coming public university, great students, interesting uh, technologies coming out of there, as well as a powerhouse in Cornell University. So as we start to think about how we're going to put this together, those will be our three themes for those initiatives. The specifics will be worked out over the next several months. The Empire State Development Corporation employees in the region will be helping us organize meetings where we'll be getting input from folks. And it will be an exciting process, and I really think that we will win. Now, I, as I tell people, I like the competition, and I like to win. But after we win, we're going to have $500 million over a few years. And we have to prove that that is all we need in order to get those 1,000 goods-producing jobs back every year. Uh, so sometimes I wake up in the middle of that and I go, boy, I hope we don't win. <laughs> That's going to be really hard. Uh, 
But, but when I look out at this kind of a, of a group of people who get together to talk about their businesses and the opportunity that we have in the Southern Tier, I feel like I want to, if I go back to sleep calmly, and know that if we do have just that little bit of capital, we will have the opportunity to, to change the area. I know you're going to hear from some of our students who are going to talk about their companies and their startup ideas. I just want to mention a couple other ones that are in our startup new package, and then maybe take a question or two. Uh, and one of them I think is extraordinarily exciting. If you look at the lithium battery that's in your phone, or if you have a car that has a lithium battery in it, it's only using 25% of its capacity. And Professor Whittingham at Binghamton University, the inventor of the lithium battery when he worked for Exxon, has actually developed a company that's being run by one of his graduate students called Charge CCD. And this company will be studying and understanding how to improve the capacity of lithium batteries. Who better to do it than, than Stan Whittingham? Uh, they've already won a federal grant of $12 million to help support the research work that's necessary. And they are currently in a competition for a $20 million investment. And I think that's going to be a very exciting opportunity. And has that goods producing possibility of generating manufacturing jobs if we decide to actually build those lithium batteries in the southern tier. Another one is uh, an existing company. People always wonder, are existing companies uh, eligible for this? They certainly are if they create a completely new division and a new uh, product, and that's Innovation Associates, a local company that has made pill-filling robots for the pharmacies in the world, in the country, and they are developing an entire new line of product line that will enhance their business, and they are a start new company actually located in our campus, in the ITC campus. And the third one that I find is very interesting if, if um, if you've ever worked with uh, the Dr. And Mr. and Dr. Kerr, they're both doctors, they're both dead, better medical doctors, you know how engaging they, engaging they are, and they've developed a company that is a software-based company that allows patients and doctors to communicate over secure networks about their treatment and their care, and to get second opinions, very low-cost second opinions on procedures that are being proposed by a doctor. And I think that's a pretty exciting uh, process. It actually has some sales and some employment growth that's occurring right now. I know I've run out of my time, plus about 20 minutes, but I'd be glad to take a question or two if that's allowed, Alan or Dan. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Center. Uh, how would you suggest local business folks direct their communication or learn about the plans going forward for the competition if they have input? Yes, uh, I always say send me an email, but that doesn't always get to the right spot. The, the person who is really helping coordinate this is her name is Bonnie Palmer. Uh, Bonnie's in the uh, state office building. Uh, she is the regional director of the Empire State Development Corporation. She'll be planning regional meetings, and that will be coming out on her website. I checked this morning, they're not there yet. But uh, bonnie.palmer at esd.ny.gov, I think is her email address. So if you can't find that, let, let me know. But Bonnie is looking for people with good ideas and, and good input. Certainly when we, when we submit this, the value of the proposal with the strength of a proposal will be how well the region accepts it and buys into it. So she wants people to be a participant in the, in the process. Thank you. All the way in the back. Hi, will nonprofits be able to participate in um, these plans? Yes, and that's a, a good question because it leads me into what, what is this proposal and the plans? Uh, the, the outcome of this next five months is going to be a plan that talks about initiatives. And, and so I was trying to give somebody an example of, of an initiative versus a project. And an initiative would be, and I'm going to take a very hypothetical one, do not write this down. Let's say that we wanted to create a food hub in the southern tier. A uh, place where goods would be collected, there might be massive farmers markets, there might be um, uh, 
county fair type of events. There would be certainly manufacturers who would be participating in this, in this food hub, kind of like a Disney World of, of food, versus we're going to invest in a food distribution center in the Continent Industrial Park. And we're going to put shovels in the ground and make it ready for a distribution center. So the initiative is a concept that we have the strengths, we have the location, the transportation infrastructure to build a food hub as opposed to a single project. So as, we look, as we're going forward, we're looking for those kind of generic ideas. And not-for-profits sometimes are the best place to get those because they, they are not perhaps sometimes uh, thinking about the profit motive of their own organization. Will not-for-profits be singled out or discussed in the proposal? I would doubt it, just like I would doubt that individual private companies will be singled out or mentioned in the proposal. But as Rich Toby said, who's helping manage this process across the state, if you've got an initiative and it has no projects, it's probably not that well thought out. If you have an initiative that spends $500 million, well, that's probably not well thought out either. So we think we have to have some projects within these initiatives. Um, and I don't, and I didn't mean to limit it to tourism, advanced manufacturing, and academic partnerships. It certainly could include agriculture here because Western Europe is not strong in agriculture. Uh, and it, could, it could include other aspects as well. So again, reaching out to Bonnie Hahn is probably the best place to get started. Jim? Quick one. Um, although I'm not a huge fan of politicians, I tend to be with them a lot. <laughs> Makes me break out the rash sometimes. <laughs> what I'd like to know from you, as I engage with some local politicians, What's the number one thing that local government can do to support Bingham University? <laughs> Daniel, Daniel's out there taking notes. Senator, uh, no, I, I think I think understand the inequities that have occurred in New York State, understanding the history of, of how those inequities occurred. And, and being able to convince their downstate colleagues that it's not that upstate folks are lazy, sitting around watching their economy run down the, the drain, uh, that they have an extraordinary advantage in the, in the downstate versus the upstate, um, and, that, and that we are looked at positively, and that there is hope for upstate to perhaps come to a new plateau. Uh, I, don't, I cannot imagine setting a thousand manufacturing jobs a year for 20 years. Can't imagine. It's almost impossible to think of. But can we stabilize it? Can, can we kind of level out where we are and then make, maybe add a few hundreds for several years? So I think what I would like them to, to recognize is that we are really smart people, we're hardworking people, that we have a disadvantage, and for them to understand the history of that disadvantage, and I always tell people, we have Love Canal. If you wonder why we have really strict Environmental regulations, we had Love Canal. We were the start of the Superfund, um, and we still have a lot of Superfunds around here. And that's because we were one of the first states to manufacture. We were one of the first states to manufacture chemicals and uh, steel and automobiles. So certainly we would be the ones who made the earliest mistakes and now have to pay for it. Uh, but do we have to pay for it all by ourselves in upstate New York, or are we a state that's working together? So I think trying to convince the downstate assembly people and senators that upstate has a future and that the reason where we are is not because we didn't care. Thank you. Startup New York, uh, for fact, they, when this came out, Preston Sun Bolton did an actual interview with me uh, regarding this. I'm a small business owner here. Uh, been here, been in business now, this is my 16th year. And we start off with the good times, we start with the bad times. And as you said, you know, we sit here and we pay our taxes. Startup New York is absolutely nothing for me. My comment to them was, why don't they just level the playing field instead of handing out these, you know, uh, just like goodwill packages to people that are only going to be here for 10 years. If they want to build something, why don't they just level the playing field so that they could bring in more industry? bring in more business, but they didn't do that. And it's like you said, they're leaving the little guys out. It's the little mom and pop guys like us that, you know, pay our taxes, we employ people, and then you got startup New York comes in and they're in and out tax-free for 10 years, property taxes and all. We've got the highest taxes in the nation, highest regulations in the nation, 
you got to have some sort of foundation for a company to build on. They're not just going to come in and, you know, because you're handing them a gimmick. I planted that question because it's a legitimate argument. Um, and I can't, I can't say that it's right. All I can say is that governments have been giving tax incentives to businesses in 50 states every year for decades. And this is just an experiment, another one that the governor is trying that maybe it will work, maybe it won't work. Maybe it has a little bit of a bias towards new, but I will say that you are eligible. If you decide that you have a product line that you want to create new employment and a new division, that new employment and new division is eligible for startup report. And I would encourage you to talk to Pierre Strompoff who's here about how you can actually position your company to take advantage of startup New York. I also think that if you just took the money and you said, I'm going to give a rebate to everybody. I've got $5 billion right now in the government, $5 billion for bank settlements. I'm going to give a rebate to everybody proportional to how much taxes they pay. Seems kind of fair, right? You know where it all go? It's all go downstate. Every one of those dollars, almost 90% of those dollars went downstate because that's where most of the state income tax is paid. And we're saying, no, leave 1.5 billion of it in upstate because we're the ones who actually need that, uh, that investment. So I, I, would, I would like to talk to you and have Pear talk to you about how we can actually have your company take advantage of starting with your own. I think that's uh, a good time to stop.